Part One: The Stain. Mr. Hiram B. Otis was American. He was very rich and very important. He wanted to live in an old house in England, so he decided to buy Canterville Chase, the home of Lord Canterville. Everyone told him that he was doing a very foolish thing. Canterville Chase is haunted, they said. Lord Canterville himself warned Mr. Otis about the ghost. Many members of my family have seen the ghost. My grand aunt, the Duchess, was dressing for dinner one night. Suddenly, the hands of a skeleton touched her on the shoulders. She has never recovered from the shock. My wife, Lady Canterville, cannot sleep at night because of the mysterious noises in the house. My lord," said Mister Otis, "I will pay you extra for the ghost. I come from a modern, democratic country. If we find a ghost, we'll put it in a museum or a show for everyone to see." Lord Canterville smiled. The ghost really exists. People have seen it many times in the last three hundred years, since fifteen eighty-four, in fact. It always appears before the death of any member of my family. In my home, joked Mister Otis. The doctor appears before the death of any member of my family. I am an American. He continued. Americans don't believe in ghosts. They are an old-fashioned European idea. If you don't mind having a ghost in the house, that's all right. But please remember that I have warned you. A few weeks later, Lord Canterville sold Canterville Chase to the Americans. There were six people in the Otis family. Mister Otis himself was a United States government minister. He was a strong Democrat. His wife, Missus Lucretia Otis, was a good-looking middle-aged lady. When she had been a young woman in New York. She had been famous for her beauty. She was full of energy and very healthy. Their eldest son was called Washington. He was tall, fair-haired, and handsome. He liked dancing very much. His sister Virginia was fifteen years old. She was lovely. Her large blue eyes had a spirit of freedom. She loved riding her pony in the country. A young English lord, Cecil, the Duke of Cheshire, was in love with her. The youngest children were twins, Ricky and Robbie. They were often naughty, but everybody liked them. When the family came to live at the house, they drove through the woods in a carriage. It was a lovely July evening. The birds were singing. Squirrels looked at them from the trees. Rabbits ran away over the grass. However, as they approached Canterville Chase, the weather changed. Dark clouds appeared. Some large black birds flew over their heads. It began to rain. In the garden. They saw a black tree with no leaves or flowers on it. An old woman, dressed in black with a white apron and cap, was waiting for them at the door of the house. This was Mrs. Umney, the housekeeper. Welcome to Canterville Chase, she said. They followed her through the dark wooden hall. Into the library, tea was ready for them. What's that? Asked Mrs. Otis suddenly. There was a dark red stain on the floor by the fireplace. It is blood, replied the old housekeeper. How horrible! Said Mrs. Otis. I don't like blood stains in the sitting room. Remove it. Mrs. Umney smiled.
It is the blood of Lady Eleanor de Canterville. Her husband, Sir Simon de Canterville, murdered her on that exact spot in 1575. Sir Simon disappeared nine years later. Nobody has ever found his body. But his guilty spirit still haunts Canterville Chase. And nobody can remove the stain. Nonsense, cried Washington. Pinkerton's champion cleaner will clean it away. It's the latest American technology. He knelt down and rubbed the floor with the champion cleaner. In a few moments, the blood had disappeared. I knew Pinkerton's would do it, he said triumphantly. At that moment, there was a great flash of lightning. There was a boom of thunder. Everyone was frightened. The ghost is angry, cried Mrs. Umney, and she fainted. The English climate is really terrible, said Mr. Otis calmly, lighting a cigar. I'm not surprised that everyone wants to leave the country to go to live in America. Look at Mrs. Umney, said his wife. She's fainted. What a useless housekeeper. We'll reduce her wages, said Mr. Otis. As soon as he said that, Mrs. Umney recovered. Don't laugh at the ghost, sir. I have seen terrible things in this house. We are Americans, said Mr. Otis. We're not afraid of ghosts. You're safe with us, added Mrs. Otis. Now let's all go to bed. Here is some information about the ghost. The ghost came quietly up the stairs from the hall. He stood still for a moment at the top of the stairs. Then he turned left. He turned left again at the corner and followed the corridor. Everybody was sleeping. First of all, he passed Washington's bedroom. He stopped outside and listened, but he did not go in. Then he continued walking. He passed a corridor on his right. Then he stopped outside the twins' bedroom. He opened the door quietly and looked inside. But he didn't go in. It was very quiet in the house. When he reached the corner, he turned left again. He passed Mr. and Mrs. Otis's bedroom in the south of the house. It was a very large room. At the corner, he turned left again. Virginia's bedroom was on his right, but he did not enter. He turned right into a corridor which took him to the east wing of the house. He walked through the room at the end of the corridor. There were two rooms in front of him. He went through the door of the right-hand room. This was the ghost's secret room. Part 2 the ghost appears. That night, there was a terrible storm. Next morning, when the family came downstairs, the stain was there again. Washington was very disappointed. Pinkerton's champion cleaner always works. He rubbed the floor with a stain remover. Next morning, the stain was there again. He removed it for a third time, and his father locked the library door at night. But in the morning, the stain was there again. This is interesting, said Mr. Hiram B. Otis. Perhaps there really is a ghost. 
Mrs. Otis wrote letters about it to all her friends in America. Washington decided to publish a scientific thesis about supernatural stains. The next night, they knew for certain that the ghost was in the house. During the dinner, they discussed America and Europe. American actresses are much better than European ones," said Mr. Otis. "American food is much better than English food," said Mrs. Otis. "Boston is more important than Rome," said Washington. "New Yorkers speak much more sweetly than Londoners," said Virginia. At eleven o'clock, they all went to bed. Suddenly, Mr. Otis woke up. It was one o'clock. There was a strange noise in the corridor. The American minister lit a candle and opened his bedroom door. In front of him, in the pale moonlight, there was a terrible old man. He had red, burning eyes. His long grey hair was thick and dirty. His old-fashioned clothes were ragged. Heavy chains were hanging from his wrists and ankles. Mr. Otis stayed absolutely calm. Your chains are making a terrible noise. You will wake up everybody in the house. Let me give you this bottle of Rising Sun American Lubricator. Put it on your chains to stop them making a noise. Good night, sir. The ghost was very surprised. He threw the bottle on the floor. Then he ran down the corridor, shouting terribly. Another bedroom door opened. The twins threw their pillows at his head. <laughs> The ghost of Sir Simon de Canterville disappeared through the wall and went to his secret room. He was very angry. For three hundred years, I have frightened everyone in this house. The servants have all run away. Famous lords have shot themselves. Famous ladies have drowned themselves in the lake. After all that. He continued. These Americans have come to live here. They have no respect. I hate them. Next morning at breakfast, the Otis family talked about the ghost. We, We hit, hit him with, with our, our pillows. <laughs> <laughs> Laughed the twins. That's not polite," said their father. "That poor ghost has lived in this house for centuries. We should respect him." On the other hand, I am sorry he has not used the Rising Sun lubricator. We must take his chains away from him. It's impossible to sleep with so much noise. Only one unusual thing happened for the rest of the week. Every evening, Washington cleaned the stain. Every morning, it had appeared again. Strangely, it was a different color. One day it was red, then it was purple. Once, it was bright green. That's strange," laughed Mrs. Otis. "I've never seen green blood before. It's not funny," said Virginia. She seemed really upset, but nobody knew why. On Sunday night, the ghost of Sir Simon decided to appear again. I will climb inside the old suit of armor in the hall. Everyone will be afraid when they see the armor moving. The armor was heavier than he expected. When he tried to put it on, it fell over with a loud crash. Oh! I've hurt my knees and elbows. The ghost cried. The noise woke everybody up. The twins ran downstairs. They shot the ghost with their pea shooters. 
Mr. Hiram B. Otis came downstairs in his pyjamas. He pointed a gun at the ghost. Hold up your hands, he said. The ghost screamed with anger. He changed into a mist and ran through them. Washington's candle went out. It was completely dark. Now I will give them my famous ghostly laughter, thought the ghost. Their hair will turn white when they hear it. Ha 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 ha! His terrible laugh echoed through the old house. Are you all right? asked Mrs. Otis. She came calmly out of her bedroom with a bottle of medicine in her hand. You must have a bad stomach ache. Take this medicine. It's made in America. It's the best in the world. The ghost was even angrier. It was impossible to frighten these people. The twins came towards him with their pea shooters. Immediately he disappeared and went to his secret room. He had failed. For some days he was very ill. He did not leave his room except to replace the bloodstain. But when he felt stronger, he decided to haunt the Otis family for the third time. I will do terrible things. They will never come back to this house. The Americans aren't afraid of me, but I have lived in this house for three hundred years. I have frightened many people. I have done terrible things. Listen to my stories. In 1730, I frightened Lady Mary. In the middle of the night, I whispered in her ear while she was asleep. I said, "If you get married, your husband will kill you." Poor Lady Mary. She woke up and screamed. She never got married. She believed what I told her. My next victim was Lord John. He came to live in Canterville Chase in 1816. He liked wine and beer and champagne. One day, when he was drunk, I carried him in my arms high up in the sky. He was so frightened. At last, I put him back on the ground. After that, he stopped drinking. He never touched alcohol again. In 1835, Prince Victor of Austria stayed in the house. While he was sleeping, I stole all his gold and money. He lost all his riches. After that. He became a beggar. In 1876, I frightened Princess Alice. I cut off all her hair in the middle of the night. When she woke up, she looked in the mirror and screamed. Then, in 1880, I frightened the Duchess of Newbury. I came in her room in the middle of the day. She told the duke her husband. When he came to look, I disappeared. He thought she was mad and divorced her. So you see, I am a very dangerous ghost. I will soon get rid of these Americans. They cannot win. Part Three: The Terrible Twins. The ghost planned his revenge. I will dress myself in old-fashioned clothes. I will wear this hat with a red feather and this shroud round my body. I will take this old knife. Then I will go to Washington's bedroom. I hate that boy because he always removes my bloodstain. I will wake him up. Then I will stab myself three times in the neck. 
he will scream with terror. Then I will go to his parents' room. I will put my hand on their faces in the middle of the night. I will whisper the secrets of death in their ears. Then I will go to the twins. I will be a skeleton. By the end of the night, they will all be mad. But I won't hurt pretty Miss Virginia. She is the only one of the family who has not laughed at me. It was the perfect night. The rain fell heavily. The wind blew round the old house. For a long time, the twins were awake. They were laughing about something. At last, the house was silent. Three hundred years ago, I murdered my wife. Now I will do another terrible thing. The ghost of Sir Simon de Canterville crept along the corridor in the darkness. A dog howled in the night. The storm clouds passed over the moon. He approached Washington's bedroom. Ah! In front of him, there was a horrible ghost. It had a round, fat, white face. Fire came from its eyes and mouth. It was covered in a long white shroud. There was a notice hanging from its neck with strange writing. Perhaps it was a list of crimes. It raised a sword in its hand. Sir Simon had never seen another ghost before. He was very afraid. He ran away back to his secret room. He was there all night in the dark, shivering with fear. At last, the sun rose. Very carefully and slowly, he went back to look at the other ghost. Perhaps it was a friend. They could work together to frighten the Americans. But the other ghost was not there. He found only a white curtain, a turnip, kitchen knife and a notice. He read these words in old-fashioned writing. Ye Otis Ghost, ye only true and original spirit, ignore all imitations. At last he understood. The twins had made the figure of a ghost. They had tricked him. I will murder them, he promised himself. The ghost was too tired and afraid to take revenge. Instead, he went back to his room and climbed inside an old, empty coffin. There he felt safe from the terrible American family. Poor ghost. He had very bad nerves. If there was a sudden noise, he jumped with fear. He did not even replace the bloodstain in the library. The Otis family come from a modern country with no history and no soul. It is impossible to live with them in the same house. But the ghost's job was to haunt Canterville Chase. Three hundred years ago, he had promised to do this. It was his duty. Every Saturday, he walked through the corridors. He was afraid of the twins, so he used rising sun lubricator on his chains. He did not want to make a noise. The twins continued to hurt him. They tied strings across the corridor so that he fell over. They put butter on the stairs so that he slipped. The ghost was very angry. He recovered his courage. I will appear as the headless lord, he decided. This time I will frighten them all. 
Seventy years ago I appeared as the headless lord in front of young Lady Barbara. She ran away from Canterville Chase and never returned. He took three hours to get ready. Then, in the middle of the night, he crept towards the twins' bedroom. He pushed the door open. <laughs> A large, heavy jug of water was on top of the door. It fell on his head. He was wet from head to toe. Sitting up in bed, the twins laughed and laughed. The ghost was afraid to leave his room. Because of the water, he had a terrible cold and sneezed all day. Achoo! Achoo! When he haunted the house after this, he was very quiet. One night, he was downstairs in the hall. He looked at the large photograph of Mr. and Mrs. Otis. Where are the old paintings of all the Lord Cantervilles? He wondered. These Americans are so uncivilized. Boo! The twins jumped out of a dark corner and shouted in his ear. The ghost ran up the stairs. Washington was waiting for him. He had a large garden syringe in his hands. Help! shouted the ghost. Help! He jumped into the fireplace and escaped up the chimney. These Americans are dangerous. I will never leave my room again. Here are the twins. Do you mind if I ask you some questions? Go ahead. We've got no secrets, have we, Ricky? No, sir. All right. First of all, how tall are you? I'm one meter thirty-nine. And what about you, Ricky? I'm one centimeter taller. I'm the best. And are there any other physical differences? Not really. I've got brown eyes, and so has Ricky. I've got dark brown hair, and so has Robbie. Do you like the same food? Yes, I love chocolate ice cream. And so do I. I see. What about sports? Robbie, what's your favorite sport? I love swimming. And I love riding. But we both love baseball as well. Do you like the same subjects at school? I like mathematics very much. But Ricky isn't any good at it. That's not true. I love mathematics too. I'm the best. I also like geography. I don't like that, but I love history. What's your favorite color, Robbie? Red. I like strong colors. My favorite color is blue. And my lucky number is 13. My lucky number is one, because I'm always number one. No, you're not. I'm number one in this family. Don't fight. But what do you want to do when you grow up? I want to be a doctor. I want to help people. But Ricky's lazy. He wants to be rich and do nothing all day. Don't listen to him. I want to be a businessman. I know that I will have to work very hard. And when I'm rich, I'll use my money to help people too. Well, thank you very much for answering my questions. In some ways you are similar, but in other ways you are very different. Part 4. Virginia Meets the Ghost The Otis family began to live a normal life. Mr. Otis wrote a history of the American Democratic Party. Mrs. Otis gave a great party in the gardens of Canterville Chase. There was American food and American games. The English lords and ladies played poker. They said to one another, oh, The Americans are not so bad after all. Virginia rode her pony in the country lanes. Cecil, the young Duke of Cheshire, came to stay at Canterville Chase. 
he wanted to marry her. Mr. Otis wrote to Lord Canterville, The ghost has gone away. Congratulations to you and your wife, replied the Lord. Everything seemed perfect. Mr. Otis was wrong. The ghost was still in his secret room, feeling very weak and ill. He heard that Cecil was in the house. I frightened his grandfather, the old Duke of Cheshire, a hundred years ago. This is my chance. I will go out again, dressed as a vampire. I will make him die with fear. The ghost got ready to haunt the house again. Then he remembered the terrible twins. No, he decided. I am too ill. I will stay in my room forever. That night, the young duke slept peacefully in his bed. What did he dream about? Virginia. The next day, the two young people went riding together. They were very happy. Then a branch tore Virginia's jacket. I must go back to the house, she told Cecil. I'll see you later. Virginia returned alone to the house. She went up the back stairs. She did not want anyone to see her torn jacket. The door of one of the rooms at the back of the house was open. There was someone inside. Who's that? She thought. Perhaps it's a servant. She went inside the room quietly. To her surprise, she saw the Canterville ghost sitting by the window. He was sadly looking at the red and golden autumn leaves. Virginia decided to speak to him. I am so sorry for you. My twin brothers are going away to Eton tomorrow. After that, if you are good, nobody will upset you. Sir Simon looked at the sweet, pretty girl. Don't ask me to be good. I am a ghost. I must make noise with my chains. I must frighten people. I must walk about at night. It is my job. I know you have been very bad, said Virginia. Mrs. Umney said that you murdered your wife. Yes, that's true, but it was a family matter. It isn't your business. It's wrong to kill anyone. The ghost became angry. My wife was ugly. She cooked badly. She didn't look after my clothes. And after she died, her brothers took revenge. Do you know what they did? No. They shut me in a room without any food until I died. Oh, Mr. Ghost, I mean Sir Simon, are you hungry? I have a sandwich here. Would you like it? No, thank you. Ghosts don't eat anything. But it is very kind of you. You are much nicer than the rest of your horrible, rude, vulgar, dishonest family. Stop! cried Virginia. You are rude and dishonest. You stole my paints and used them to replace the blood stain. That is why it was sometimes red. Sometimes purple, sometimes green. I love painting, but you took all my colors. I'm sorry, said the ghost. It is very difficult to get real blood these days. Your horrible brother removed the stain every day with his Pinkerton's champion cleaner. It was necessary to use your paints. It wasn't wrong. You Americans don't understand ghosts. Virginia was angry too. You know nothing about it. You must come to America. Then you will understand. My father will get you a free ticket. You will be a great success in New York. The people will pay a hundred thousand dollars for a ticket to see you. I don't like America. You have no history. All you have is money and bad manners. Goodbye, said Virginia angrily. I will go and get the twins. The ghost looked sorry. Please don't go, Miss Virginia, he cried. 
I am so lonely and unhappy. I don't know what to do. I want to go to sleep, but I cannot. That's ridiculous. Just go to bed. Blow out your candle and close your eyes. It's not at all difficult to fall asleep. I do it very easily in church on Sundays. Even babies know how to sleep. I have not slept for three hundred years, said the ghost sadly. I am so tired. Listen carefully to these questions. Tick your answers in the book. I shall repeat each question. Number one. If a friend tells you that he or she has seen a ghost, do you a tell him or her to see a psychiatrist? B. Believe him or her immediately. C. Ask for more information. D. Telephone the newspapers and try to sell the story. I'll repeat that. Number one. If a friend tells you that he or she has seen a ghost, do you a Tell him or her to see a psychiatrist. B. Believe him or her immediately. C. Ask for more information. D. Telephone the newspapers and try to sell the story. Now listen to number two. Number two. If someone offers you fifty thousand pounds to sleep alone in a haunted house, do you a agree because it is a safe way to make money? B refuse to do so because you are afraid. C ask for time to think about it. D. Invite a TV film crew to meet you there. I'll repeat that. Number two. If someone offers you fifty thousand pounds to sleep alone in a haunted house, do you a agree because it is a safe way to make money? B Refuse to do so because you are afraid. C. Ask for time to think about it. D. Invite a TV film crew to meet you there. Now listen to number three. Number three. If a ghost appears in your room, do you a Believe it is a dream. B. Run out of the house in your pajamas. C. Go nearer and touch it. D. Sell tickets to people who want to see it. I'll repeat that. Number three. If a ghost appears in your room, do you a Believe it is a dream. B. Run out of the house in your pajamas. C. Go nearer and touch it. D. Sell tickets to people who want to see it. Now listen to number four. Number four. If there is a TV program about ghosts, do you a Watch it and laugh at it. B. Stay at home specially to watch it. C. Watch it if there is nothing better to do. D. Invent a story about seeing a ghost and ask to appear on the program. I'll repeat that. 
Number four. If there is a TV program about ghosts, do you a watch it and laugh at it? B stay at home specially to watch it. C watch it if there is nothing better to do. D invent a story about seeing a ghost and ask to appear on the program. Now add up your points. For each A, give yourself zero points. For each B, give yourself ten points. For each C, give yourself five points. For each D, give yourself twenty points. Part five. The garden. Virginia's of beautiful blue eyes opened in wonder. Her lips trembled with emotion. She knelt at his side and looked up into his tired old face. Poor, poor ghost, she whispered. Haven't you got a place where you can sleep? Far away on the other side of the woods, he answered in a low, dreamy voice. There is a little garden. The grass is long and deep. The flowers are great white stars. The nightingale sings all night long while the cold moon looks down. The old tree spreads its branches over the sleepers. Virginia began to cry. You mean the Garden of Death? Yes, death. Death must be so beautiful. I want to lie in the soft brown earth with the grass above my head. I want to listen to silence. There is no yesterday and no tomorrow. I can forget time. I can forgive life. I can be at peace. He looked into Virginia's blue eyes. You can help me. You can open the doors of death's house for me. You have love. Love is stronger than death. Virginia trembled. She suddenly felt very cold. For a few moments, there was silence. It seemed like a terrible dream. Then the ghost spoke again. Have you seen the old writing on the library window? Often, said Virginia. I know it well. There are six lines. They say that a golden girl will help you to pray. The black tree will have flowers. A child will cry. Then the house will all be still, and peace will come to Canterville. But what does it mean? It means, he said sadly, that you must cry for me, because I cannot cry. You must pray for me, because I have no words. If you have always been sweet and good and kind, the angel of death will forgive me. You will see terrible things. Devils will haunt you. Bad voices will whisper in your ears. But nobody can hurt you, because you are so good. Virginia was silent for a few minutes. The ghost was very sad. She was looking down at the floor. He could see her golden hair, but not her beautiful blue eyes. Perhaps she would not help him. Then she stood up with a strange light in her eyes. I am not afraid. Take me to the Garden of Death. I will ask the Angel of Death to forgive you. The ghost stood up. His eyes were happy. He took her hand and kissed it. His lips were as cold as ice, and his fingers were as hot as fire. Bravely, 
Virginia followed him across the dark room. Voices said, Go back, go back. The ghost held her hand tightly and she closed her eyes. Horrible animals looked at her from the darkness. Be careful, Virginia. Be careful. We'll never see you again if you go with him, they said. The ghost went more quickly. Virginia did not listen to the voices. At the end of the room, he stopped and said some strange words. The wall opened. In front of her, it was completely black. A cold wind blew. Invisible hands pulled at her dress. Quickly, quickly, cried the ghost. Or it will be too late. The wall closed behind them. The room was empty. Go upstairs and find Miss Virginia, said Mrs. Otis to one of the servants. It's tea time. The servant returned. I cannot find your daughter anywhere, madam. The twins and Washington looked for her in the garden. Mr. and Mrs. Otis searched every room. Nobody was able to find her. Perhaps the gypsies have taken her, said Mr. Otis. There is a group of gypsies camping in the park. I'll go to look for her there. Please let me go with you, said the young Duke of Cheshire. No, Cecil, you're too young. Stay in the house with my wife and children. Mr. Otis got on his horse and went to look for her. You will never see her again, whispered the bad voices in the empty room. Far away, on the other side of the woods, there is a little garden. The grass is long and deep. The flowers are great white stars. The nightingale sings all night long while the cold moon looks down. The old tree spreads its branches over the sleepers. It is the garden of death. Far away, on the other side of the mountain, there is a deep lake. The water is cold and dark. The swans are beautiful, silent ghosts. The fish glide beneath the surface, while the sun sets behind the high, black rocks. The ferryman and his passengers disappear in the mist. It is the lake of forgetfulness. Far away on the other side of the desert there is a great city. The palaces are tall and golden the parks are full of roses and lilies. The music goes on all night and all day, while the people tell each other their dreams. The sun shines down on the dancers and the singers. It is the city of life. Part 6. The Flowering Tree The gypsies had gone. Mr. Otis sent telegrams to the police asking them to look for a young girl. Then he rode away to look for her himself. Cecil followed him on his pony. I must go with you, Mr. Otis. I love her. Don't send me back. Mr. Otis smiled kindly. Well, come with me then. 
They went first to the railway station. Have you seen Miss Virginia? No, said the station master. They soon found the gypsies, but Virginia was not with them. We are very sorry that she is lost, said the gypsy leader. Let us help you to look for her. The police looked in the lake. They searched every corner of Canterville Chase. Mrs. Otis was terribly unhappy. I'll telephone Scotland Yard, said Mr. Otis. They must send me their best detectives. At midnight, everyone was still awake. It was impossible to sleep. There was a great crash of thunder. Strange music floated through the air. Suddenly, the wall opened. And Virginia appeared. She came down the stairs. Her face was very white. She was carrying a small box. Mrs. Otis put her arms around her. The Duke kissed her. The twins danced with happiness. Where have you been? asked Mr. Otis angrily. Thank God we have found you, said his wife softly. Papa? Explained Virginia. I've been with the ghost. He's dead. You must come and see him. He had been very bad, but he was really sorry. He gave me this box of jewels before he died. The family stared at her in surprise. She took them through the opening in the wall and down a secret corridor. They came to a great door. What was on the other side? Virginia opened the door. Washington held his candle up. They saw a small, low room like a prison cell. A skeleton was chained to an iron ring in the wall. It tried to reach a dish and a jug on the floor. Virginia knelt down next to the skeleton and began to pray. It must be the skeleton of Sir Simon de Canterville, whispered Mrs. Otis. Hey, called one of the twins. Look out of the window. The old black tree has got flowers on it. I can see the blossom in the moonlight. God has forgiven him, said Virginia. There was a beautiful light around her face. You are an angel, said the young duke, and kissed her warmly. Four days later, at eleven o'clock at night, a funeral started from Canterville Chase. There were eight black horses pulling a carriage with black ostrich plumes on their heads. Servants walked with burning torches. Lord Canterville was there. He sat with Virginia in the first carriage. Her parents were in the next carriage, then Washington and the twins. Mrs. Umney was in the last carriage. They buried the coffin with the bones of Sir Simon de Canterville in the old churchyard. As they put the coffin in the ground, Virginia put a cross of blossom from the tree on it. The moon came out from the clouds and shone down. A nightingale began to sing. Virginia remembered the ghost story of the Garden of Death. She cried silently. She did not speak as they all drove home to Canterville Chase. Next morning, Lord Canterville said goodbye to the Otis family. You must take the jewels which the ghost gave my daughter, Mr. Otis told him. They are your family's jewels. The jewels were very beautiful. There was a very valuable ruby necklace from Venice and many other wonderful things. No, said Lord Canterville. Virginia must keep them. She has helped Sir Simon. The jewels belong to her. 
Mr. Otis was not happy about this. My daughter is only a child. She does not need these jewels. Americans are very simple, democratic people. We don't believe in lords and ladies. We don't want their fine jewels. My dear sir, the jewels are hers. If I take them from her, Sir Simon will never forgive me. He will come back and haunt me. Please let her keep them. Some time later. Virginia married Cecil, the young Duke of Cheshire. At her wedding, she was wearing the Canterville jewels. After the honeymoon, Virginia and her new husband visited Canterville Chase. They walked together through the woods to Sir Simon's grave. Virginia put roses there. Then they sat silently, thinking about the past. Virginia. Said the Duke, "A wife must have no secrets from her husband." But, darling, I have no secrets from you. Yes, you have never told me the truth about you and the ghost. What happened? Where did you go with him? I have never told anyone. You may tell me. Please don't ask me. I cannot tell you. Poor Sir Simon, he made me see what life is and what death is. And why love is stronger than both. The Duke kissed her lovingly. Keep your secret, he said, and I will keep your heart. You have always had that, Cecil. But you will tell your secret to our children one day, won't you? Children. Virginia blushed. Welcome to Strange but True, a weekly program about the supernatural. Tonight we have a very special guest in the studio. Hello, Bob. Hello, Virginia. Those are very beautiful jewels which you are wearing. Thank you. I got them from my great grandmother, the Duchess of Cheshire. That's interesting. Was she an English aristocrat? No, she was American. But she married an English duke. They lived in England. Her father was a famous American minister, Hiram B. Otis. I see. Did the duke give her the jewels? No, the jewels came from a ghost. A ghost? Do you really believe that? Yes, Bob, I do. My great grandmother told me the story before she died. She was a sweet, innocent lady. I think she was telling me the truth. And where did she meet the ghost? She was a young girl. Her father decided to buy an old house in England. Then strange things began to happen. Hmm.、Huh. What kind of strange things? Do you think you can tell us about some of them? <laughs> 